what's happening to children and uh, under five. So how we can actually uh, apply an intersectional lens uh, to analyzing the impact, but also to responding um, to the pandemic. Right. Um, great. Thank you so much. Um, Joyce? Yeah. Uh, what worries me most as Jemima and Godfrey is the effect of uh, COVID-19 on uh, food and nutrition security and more so on the nutrition security, which is mostly forgotten. And um, this is because uh, it affects, it has some irreversible um, consequences and especially to children below two years, which in case something goes wrong in their development, when they are growing up, even their brains will not uh, develop to their full potential. And therefore we are looking at a, um, a future that will have maybe people who are unable to do what they are supposed to do, uh, not because of their mistake, but because something happened during their, their development. So I'm so much concerned on the issues of uh, the double nutrition burden uh, especially on the access of um, um, some of the micronutrients that uh, babies and uh, young people are supposed to get when they are growing up. So actually, that worries me more. Oh, this is the, this is actually um, quite true. Now, I'd like to um, ask a question directly to a uh, bit of feedback um, from to Jemima in regards to what she said. Um, do you have any evidence on the differential impact on women and men and how you are repurposing your investments? Um, and how does that look for the livestock sector in terms of moving forward? Thank you, Muthoni. So, so there's a couple of things that, that we know already. So we know that uh, a majority of of women work in the informal sector. So that we know. Um, we know that a lot of um, our food trade, our cross-border trade, um, even in the continent is done by women. And when COVID hit, these were some of the sectors that were most affected. When borders closed, um, when, when markets closed uh, with the requirements for social distancing, that a lot of those who were affected were the 60 to 80% of women that are to be found in this informal, uh, informal sector. The second thing that we know is that COVID has had a huge impact on unpaid, the unpaid care burden of, of, of women. What we still don't know is how much this has then um, impacted their economic, uh, their economic activities. I was just chatting with someone before now uh, a lot of our, the schools where our, ch our children go opened yesterday. So even as we do this, we are balancing between trying to get kids to learn as well as participate in economic activities like this, um, like this webinar. And that's happening across board, even to rural women who form the majority of the labor for livestock. So obviously we are expecting that there'll be some impact there, uh, some impact there as well. There's also some positive things that we know um, that even in countries, in situations where women have been involved in, in the response strategies that we've been seeing some, some bigger impacts, some um, more inclusive recovery, uh, recovery efforts. Now, even from previous research, if you look at, um, at, at household consumption of especially protein-rich uh, protein foods, including animal source foods, we know there's a lot of gender barriers, cultural barriers that have led to intra-household allocation of these foods that often quite um, inequitable. And when these foods are in, in, in shortage, then we actually expect those inequalities to actually uh, to actually grow. So there are some things we know from previous research and we can hypothesize that with COVID and the impact we are seeing of COVID that these inequalities are gonna grow. But we also have some positive, we know we have lessons of how we can actually get around this by engaging women, by listening to women's voices, by making sure that we are targeting some of the interventions to those who are much more vulnerable and those who are more affected by the pandemic. 
Ahmed, um, thank you so much for that, Jemima. Um, you've given quite a bit of um, nuggets of information that is actually answering quite a number of the uh, questions that I had um, leading forward. Um, in terms of, for the rest of the panelists, how robust or how reliable is the evidence based uh, um, in regards to what we're currently seeing? In terms of what are we learning and um, or what is missing? And I, I open this to anyone on the panel. Yes, um, as far as uh, nutrition is concerned, there exists a lot of uh, literature and knowledge base on the effect of COVID-19 on uh, nutrition. But still, a lot has to be, to be done. There's need for stable and reliable um, surveillance, nutrition-related surveillance and systems put in place that are either web-based or phone-based to ensure that we have, uh, we are able to constantly monitor consumption pattern, food market systems, and food uh, availability. With that, maybe we are able to like more likely identify uh, populations that are suffering or populations that are, are at risk. And of course, we are able to have a timely response to some of the factors that are negatively affecting the nutrition status of the most vulnerable over from my side. Right. Yes. Anyone else? Uh, if I can come in, um, mm -hmm. from the African Union you know, Commission side, the evidence we have uh, on the trend of food security on the continent is from the tracking of the implementation of the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, CADAP. And the report from 2019, uh, showed that the, the African continent was not uh, on track towards achieving zero hunger by 2025, because that is the target that heads of state and government um, committed themselves to in Malabo in 2014 to achieve zero hunger by 2025. So when we traced the performance of countries between 2015 and 2019, only one country out of the, 50, of the 49 countries that reported in 2019 was on track towards um, achieving that, that target. And that country was, was Uganda. So already, and this was before COVID-19 hit, hit the world. So a lot of work needs to be done um, at member state level to increase investments in those areas that can increase uh, food availability access uh, to improve nutrition on the continent. And so what we're observing with the effect of, cut of COVID is exacerbating an already uh, uh, bad situation on the continent that we are not making progress towards eliminating hunger. Over. Thank you. If I can come, come in next. Um, I think you know from a uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation point of view, we are we think that there's a huge gap of knowledge and understanding in objective data on the demand and supply, and you know in order to how best to improve the supply within Africa for the African continent consumption um, in an optimal way, you know balancing the downsides of climate, um, the downsides of intensification with optimizing the production to meet the demand, demand in an economic sustainable way, socially sustainable way, as well as um, environmentally sustainable way. So, you know, you, know, you can't, you know, all three sustainability angles are important, but, you know, you need to make sure that, um, you know, whatever you do, it's an optimal balancing act rather than just one versus the other. Um, you know, just going back to Dr. Godfrey's point, um, you know, we, we know in Africa disproportionately, livestock contributes to a huge amount of, um, amount of uh, GDP, ag agriculture GDP, nutritional and food security, uh, as we have heard pre previously. But the investment and the priority that is based by governments is very disconnected to the contribution it makes in multiple economic growth, nutritional um, importance, um, and agriculture GDP in terms of production-wise. 
Um, so, you know, if you had that information properly, that will drive the policy to invest in, you know, under the CADA program, there was a intention to invest 30% of the 10% of national investment um, by countries into livestock, but that's not happening at all. Um, so hopefully we can f uh, fill those gaps of information, knowledge, so that data-based information, uh, data-based decisions can be made by policymakers and therefore optimize the production to meet the demand and needs of African continent. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, just to uh, bridge on to what you've just spoken about, Sam, is um, Joyce actually works for a development program in Kenya, and they recently did a study on um, the effect of the pandemic on the livestock sector in the Asals in Kenya. Uh, Joyce, can you share with us um, two or three of the biggest impacts uh, you are seeing on the ground? Yes. <laughs> One of the uh, impacts that uh, COVID is having, and especially with the county governments in Kenya, is the issue of the physical impact. Uh, most of the counties uh, rely basically on the national government funding. And they are supposed to also generate some of the local uh, money from uh, uh, taxes and other property rates. However, due to the closure of these markets and major livestock markets, it had an impact on the revenue streams at the county level. And therefore, what we are seeing, we are seeing uh, counties are being stressed and they are facing some vegetary constraints as a result of, uh, of COVID. We also saw that uh, some counties are trying to reallocate some of the funds that they are given for development uh, um, uh, functions to the health sector. And whilst some of them were even uh, are trying to reallocate money that is made for nutrition to uh, the health sector. So it's like uh, the health sector, and I agree, it, it's now the priority of both the national government as well as the, the county government. But again, the question would be, if now we, uh, money is reallocated to the the health sector, then what happens to the other sectors and also, and specifically the nutrition sector? Of course, this is going to have uh, very uh, grievous uh, uh, implications on the nutrition security in Northern Kenya, because this study was basically carried out in, in Northern Kenya among the pastoral communities. Uh, another uh, key finding was that um, the animal health service delivery has also been greatly affected. Uh, study shows that um, uh, most of the agrovets who are operating in, in Northern Kenya have greatly reduced their sales. This is an implication that fewer farmers or fewer pastoralists are going to buy drugs from their agrovets. And this will of course have a, a, a great impact on um, out disease outbreaks and therefore the food and nutrition security in the region will also be greatly affected. Uh, one last uh, uh, key finding from the, the study was that um, most of the households or most of the uh, um, pastoralists have now uh, uh, reduced their intake of, uh, or their dietary diversity has actually changed. They are taking in more of the carbohydrates they are skipping meal. Some of them are doing one meal a day, and therefore their food and nutrition security is at, at, at stake. Uh, the consumption rate, I think around 60% 60, 60 uh, within one week consumption reported to have even taken a, a, a protein in their meal. So at least something needs to be done as far as the pastoral community is concerned because what we know is that their, their, their food and nutrition security has been at stake for over a very long time and COVID is likely to affect them further. Over from my side. All right, thank you so much, Joyce. Um, Godfrey, according to what you're hearing and considering um, the expectations of Malabo 2025, and the impact it will have on the sector. How is the commission working with um, agricultural ministers to ensure that we stay on track? Um, yeah, thank you, Mazzoni. 
Well, let, let me make two points. Um, the first one is to say that Africa's food systems were vulnerable before COVID-19. And if you have been observing the trend within our sector, in the last three years, the sector has been hit by three, three shocks. Uh, we had the Ford Army Worm in 2018. We had the, that, and that affected about 52 countries on the continent. In 2019, uh, we had the, the um, uh, desert locusts within the, especially the East African region, uh, decimating crops and pasture for, for, for livestock. And in 2020, we now have COVID-19. And so these are three sh shocks to Africa's agriculture food systems on top of other environmental natural effects like climate change um, that results into droughts and, um, and floods um, uh, across the continent all impacting negatively on, uh, on, on, on our system. So what we at the African Union Commission, and this is my second point, are doing, given our uh, continental mandate, is to mobilize political leaders, especially ministers, um, bring them together to discuss the short and medium term impacts of COVID-19 and what can be done to uh, build back better and stronger. So. In April this year, we organized a meeting of ministers of agriculture and was attended by 45 ministers from across the continent, out of 55, huge, huge meeting, discussing the impacts of uh, COVID-19 on, on food systems and, and so on. Now, out of that uh, ministerial meeting was a ministerial declaration uh, with clear um, actions calling for interventions by member states. Some of those interventions were within agriculture, others by ministers of trade or ministers of trade and others by ministries of finance. And those ministers of trade and finance were not in the April meeting. So what we did to make sure that we complete the discussion in July, at the end of July this year, we organized now a tripartite meeting that brought together ministers of agriculture, ministers of trade and ministers of finance. So that the, the intervention that ministers of agriculture want and those of trade want, as long as they have financial implications, the ministers of trade are in the room listening in to see how the resources need to be either mobilized internally or repurposed or sought extra resources from, from um, uh, either loans or, or donations uh, to intervene. So it was a huge meeting. Um, to bring together these ministers to have a joint, a joint action agenda as the outcome of, of that ministerial um, meeting. So we as African Union Commission are doing mobilization, political mobilization and advocacy to bring together the stakeholders to address these challenges that are being addressed in, in a cohesive manner, but also creating platforms for lesson learning and experience sh sharing uh, across the continent. Okay, thank you so much, Godfrey. Um, I think I'd like to pull a question from um, the chat group. I think uh, there's a very interesting conversation that's going on there, and it would only be fair for us to hear from um, some of the, the, the chats. What are some of the questions? There's a question here that's directed to Sam, and the question is, what do you see as some ways African countries can influence how people in the, glo in the global or north or development countries perceive livestock? God, oh, um, that's, that's a great question. Um, I wish I knew that because uh, then my job will be done. Um, you know, I think, you know, I have, I have been watching that chats as well. You know, there's some people saying about, you know, Africa has no problem with, um, you know, with livestock per se. But in the Western world, in the Northern world, um, you know, people with plenty, you know, lives, you know, eating animal source foods have become more of a choice rather than, you know, the only or the most uh, accessible um, um, uh, way to have nutritious food. And, and people are increasingly, there are so many, um, what's the word, so many 
anti sentiments are growing and that is influencing global policymakers and global influencers, um, including uh, donors and investors. Um, so again, you know, the, the point, you know, again, as we are talking about building back better, um, you know, with this COVID crisis, we are, you know, we the vulnerable areas in the world, including Africa, um, has been affected. But as we build better, you know, if you can communicate, if you can advocate for a sustainable way of growing rather and learning from the mistakes that the West has made, um, you know, causing the uh, damages, including, um, you know, increasing them sort of management system or production systems that enhance the probability of uh, pathogens jumping from one species to another species, including to humans. So, you know, if you can really build that back in a much more sustainable, balanced, optimal way um, and communicate and advocate that, that's probably the best um, we can do, in my opinion. And that's what I, we do at the foundation. That's what we try to communicate, um, you know, using the brand of the foundation as well. There was a question that was tabled to Godfrey on the chat that was, um, he, you, Godfrey, you, you spoke a bit on it, but I think it's important that everyone else hears. And the question is, do you think that livestock, the livestock sector will provide um, natural and nutritious food when we stop importing processed food? And this is an open question. It's not necessarily only for Godfrey. Um, well, I think for us, uh, as the African Union Commission, we take uh, two positions on, on livestock. Um, one, we recognize the importance of livestock in um, uh, improving people's livelihoods in as far as um, being a source of income is concerned. Um, and as I, I think it was Sam who mentioned, um, almost close to 40% of Africa's GDP is from livestock. So it's very important for as a source of uh, income, as a source of livelihoods. But also we, the, the other perspective um, that we take is from the nutrition point of view. And I think it was Jemima who took some time to, to go through, um, or, or was it Joyce, um, the, the benefits of um, feeding on, uh, on, on protein, um, especially from animal sources for kids under the age of five, um, and the impact that has on both the short-term and long-term growth and productivity as a human being. And so we advocate for um, production um, and availability of these um, uh, protein sources to our children um, under the age, the age of five. Uh, and thirdly, um, we, we hope that with the coming on board of the Africa continental free trade area, um, when it becomes operational, that there will be increased intra-regional trade in agricultural products, including livestock products, so that we, we reduce the level of import of these foods from outside, outside of the continent. As you know, at the moment, the estimate is between 35 to, 40 to 45 billion dollars a year that Africa um, spends on food importation. If this can be saved uh, by producing on the continent, including um, livestock products, I think that would be better for our farmers and that would be better for um, consumers. So if I may add to that as well, just to, you know, the imports and a process for, you know, importing versus product produce, locally producing, at the moment, at the current level of productivity, um, the demand is unlikely to be met. The consumption demand is unlikely to be met by the local production adequately and in a quality and in a timely way based on the data we have. This is why we, you know, I mentioned before, the supply demand data is not um, complete or accurate, uh, but directionally at least what the data suggests is the current production, the efficiency of production is um, inadequate to meet the demand. And therefore, if you abruptly stop or block the imports, it's likely that the prices can go up and, um, and also the availability and affordability might be 
negatively impacted for the African consumers. Now, having said that, and this is why we think, you know, we should rapidly increase productivity. There are so many, you know, there's huge yield gaps that exist um, in African production versus what is possible, even in the, in the given agroecology. So, you know, if you can focus on really increasing the production and uh, productivity of African livestock, um, then we can sort of bridge that much faster and uh, effectively. Thanks. Actually, to follow up on what you've just spoken about, Sam, um, there's a question from the, the chat that actually asks about, do we know enough about the de-urbanization impact, basically, of people migrating back to rural areas during COVID in African countries? And what is um, what it's doing positively and negative, negatively in terms of food security and natural resource integrity and productivity. I open this to anyone. Yeah, I'll let somebody else um, answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we, we, we have seen, and not just in Africa, we've seen cases in, in India as well, where there is, um, we're calling it the reverse migration from, from urban areas to, to rural areas. And that's going to have implications on, on, on several things. One is that, um, and especially when you get more young people going back into rural areas, we are likely to see a renewed focus on development of rural areas. So rural development basically starts to become much more prominent as, as, as uh, previously depopulated rural areas start to, to, to become much more vibrant. Uh, but within the African context, what we are also tr likely to see is, is, is pressure on, on, on land resources because as people go back to, to, to rural areas, then there's much more demand for production, for production resources, and especially with young people who currently might not own land and that have to, to, to survive. So that's something we need to think about. But it's, I see it also as a huge opportunity for, for the livestock sector in terms of how do we, as Sam says, how do we start thinking about much more efficient ways and productive ways of, um, of, of raising livestock productivity. We've been, for example, investing the last five years um, uh, with ECPE on how you can uh, use insect-based feed to, to feed livestock and reduce the competition between human and animal food for, for, for corn, for soybean, um, for fish meal, et, et cetera. So I also see a positive in the sense that it, it, it makes us even from a research perspective think much more creatively about not just how to develop rural areas, but also how to invest much more in increasing um, productivity when you have much more demand for resources like, like land. And that's a huge opportunity for, for, for livestock, for small livestock, for, for aquaculture um, and, and other such systems that require less land but could do with, with much more efficient uh, production methods. And, and I would guess that would also have, a, 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 it's, it's, it's easy to look at that reverse migration as bad for environment, but if you're really thinking creatively about it, it could actually have some positive impact on the environment as well. Well, right. I, if I can come in here on that point, I, I don't think I do agree with, the, with the, those observations. I think they are speculatory observations if you ask me. Nobody has concrete data um, to, to, to make strong statements about, about this deurbanization or reverse migration. Um, I think we need to give this time and those people who are in the field of research, we need to have data maybe over a two, three year period uh, rather than a period of six months when COVID has hit, has hit uh, the continent. Uh, because it's just from February and March to, to now that you see people basically not abandoning urban life but escaping the crowded urban centers to go and survive in rural areas. That does not mean that they don't want to go back in urban centers. And so I don't think it's, it's right to say that we are seeing um, um, a sustained uh, deurbanization or uh, urban rural migration phenomenon. I, I don't think that is correct. Uh, 
but I, I, I um, would want to hear about yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, Godfrey, we are seeing some trends. It's important that we monitor those trends in the next um, in the next two to three years to see what happens. But I guess that's also some of the problems we, we have that when we, we, we do not want to be reactionary to it, that we also need to be predicting given some of the anecdotal data and, and some of the preliminary data that we are seeing what's gonna, what's gonna happen. So I'm, I'm actually not, um, I would say we need to monitor, yes, but we also need to, to start anticipating what the longer term impact of this um, pand pandemic are going to be. And, and a big role for researchers is also to start helping us to model what that, might, uh, what that might look like. So I don't think we have to wait until two to three years now to deal with what those issues uh, that might, might arise are, but we need to start thinking about what it will mean for, for agriculture. Oh, I like how it's getting juicy. <laughs> um, so that I can let everyone have an opportunity to close, what do you think are uh, one of, at least give me one bold next step that we need to take um, to tackle the pandemic harm or, or grasp an opportunity? I'll go around the room. I'll start with Godfrey. What do you think? Well, they are, um, they are both short and medium term um, opportunities to um, think about recovery from the, from the, the pandemic. Um, God, I'll only ask for one. I just want to hear from you. What is the one bold one you think that needs to be urgently grasped onto? I think um, increasing financing for agriculture would go a long way um, to uh, build resilient food systems because we observe again from the 2019 Kadapa Annual Review Report that there was not a single country on the continent that was meeting the Kadapa target of spending 10% of the, of the national expenditure on agriculture. Not a single country uh, over a, a four year period. And so when you starve the agriculture sector of resources, definitely you weaken it both in the short and medium term. So the, the, the appeal would be to, uh, for our member states to increase uh, financing going to, into the agriculture sector. Thank you, Geoffrey. Godfrey, sorry. Sam. Okay, uh, my first one would have been what Godfrey said about increased investments, but uh, the next one would be, uh, given the visibility, the you know, positive opportunity that the COVID has created is to improve the well animal health and well-being or welfare of animals um, in the country. And if you know with that investment, if you can build a system, you know, one disease at a time, this you know, developing and vaccines or um, campaigns for control of one disease at a time, instead of doing that, if you can really um, strengthen the veterinary services that underpins a functioning of um, veterinary professional veterinary services, uh, performance of veterinary services. Mm -hmm. That would be a fantastic opportunity to sort of exploit that and work with OIE, which is trying to do the performance of veterinary services. You know, they are you know, very well established to do that. And you know, it's a really good opportunity to strengthen the veterinary services. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Jemima? Um, I think my one big one is to make sure we are focusing on people and what's happening to, to, to people and the impact on people and make sure we are redirecting our resources in ways that we are not leaving anyone behind. Great. Joyce. Yes. Uh, for me, that one big thing that needs to be done and the opportunity that uh, COVID has created is the opportunity to adopt improved technologies. Uh, this is because uh, uh, some of these uh, calamities, some of these effects are almost inevitable. And therefore, now that every country has the role to ensure that its citizens are food secure, then adoption of uh, improved technologies would be a key way, a sure way of ensuring this is done. 
here I'm talking about adoption of uh, uh, technologies like the e-extension, for example, to ensure that farmers, pastoralists are getting information with when they need it, how they need it, and also for the spoilage. During our study, we saw that people are, and people are actors in the livestock value chain. They are getting a lot of losses as a result of uh, spoilage. Milk, uh, meat is getting spoiled. So improved technologies will be an opportunity that uh, COVID has created that is likely to improve both the nutrition security, food security, as well as uh, improve the economic development. Of all right, thank you very much. I think that was indeed a hard talk and um, I really appreciate the time and um, uh, contributions that you've given to this discussion. I know this is just the, but the beginning of this um, uh, topic and I hope that there's a lot of learnings that we've gotten from here. And we'd like to hear from um, Boni, who will now uh, talk about the next part where we'd like contributions from our Rex. Bonnie? Thank you so much, Mutoni. Um, I just want to join you in thanking the panelists for, for their contributions and really raising some uh, key issues uh, in that uh, panel. It was a hard talk. We could see the exchanges. Thank you so much. Uh, well done, everyone. Uh, in this meeting, we have representatives from the regional economic communities would like to open up uh, these sessions for their contributions. We know that they've been working on the uh, regional response plans uh, for COVID-19. So we would like them to share some two to three highlights on, on, some, on what is coming up on some of these uh, plans. So to start off, they have about three minutes each uh, to start off we will have a representative from ECOWAS, uh, who is Dr. Vivian Iwa, to share some highlights on their regional re response plans. Over to you, Dr. Vivian. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, beautiful discussions. Um, when one listens to the speakers, the challenges are really clear and mostly the same everywhere. Of course, with individual peculiarities in the different countries based on the subsistence systems and processes pre-pandemic, and of course, uh, the management approaches that have uh, been used uh, to control the pandemic. Uh, in the ECOWAS region, the coordinated approaches learned and the systems and processes built from the Ebola virus disease outbreak experience has been of uh, great value in dealing with the pandemic. Still, there have been challenges uh, such that were presented in session one, including uh, the fact that farmers uh, were giving out products free. Uh, there were delays in arrival of necessary imports. Uh, and of course, the consequences on food and security and nutrition security, livelihoods, and economic growth. Um, a major challenge that remains is how to open up safely. And this goes to the issue of opening up schools, picking up the economy, and building uh, up more resilient uh, populations. Our coordinated approach uh, in the region uh, for agriculture development and environment issues are hinged on two broad policies. The ECOWAS agriculture policy, commonly referred to as the ECOWAP and the ECOWAS environment policy, uh, referred to as the ECOWEP. All strategic action plans emanate from these policies. Uh, uh, from there, we get the strategies on food and nutrition security. We have the animal health and welfare strategy the gender and livelihood strategy, climate change and resilience, and et cetera. And we also have disease specific strategies, such as the one on PPR, on rabies, and on others. This wholesome approach 
supports the broad vision and goal and support appropriate coordination and harmonization efforts in the ECOWAS, which became very useful uh, in moving in one direction at the outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, and indeed in helping to identify where needs were higher and sharing resources accordingly. In the livestock sector, we adopted four main approaches, control of uh, TADS, transboundary animal diseases and zoonosis, strengthening the One Health collaboration uh, platforms and systems, strengthening the ICT systems for veterinary service delivery, strengthening and building partnerships. But I think additionally, research for livestock development is an area that needs to be explored, particularly as it relates to the development of basic technologies and communication tools between farmers and service delivery. The focus on animal disease control is on economically significant transboundary animal diseases and currently mass vaccinations against PPR that were started in, uh, in identified um, um, gap areas um, went on um, immediately uh, movement um, resumed in the region. And our strategy is based on progressive expansion of uh, that uh, uh, strategy of controlling PPR. As we all know, for low resourced homes and communities, the one or two goods or sheep that free range could stand between the family falling deeper into poverty and or losing resilience with direct consequences on livelihoods. A loss of such a resource could mean the difference between a child's school fees being paid or not. And in most communities also, uh, the goats and sheep are owned by women. And this has clear implications for, for losing those animals. Uh, so the prevention of control of PPR is a major focus for us. On um, One Health, um, due to the outbreak of Ebola, we established a One Health platform and started building systems to, of approaching diseases uh, through the One Health uh, approach. The prioritization of seven zoonotic diseases in the region uh, for control, including rabies, is one of the highlights of uh, establishing that platform. And indeed, um, there's, there's a strategy for rabies control focused um, on the One Health approach. Technology has become critical also, uh, not just for the daily work as this meeting itself shows, but also for field work. The ECOWAS region is adopting and strengthening technologies for future interactions and particularly for surveillance. For example, this kind of meeting uh, was hosted uh, in what we called a discussion form, uh, forum in the region under the Palava tree with over 300 participants and including a variety of um, stakeholders that was due to um, use of technology. We are learning and deploying basic technologies such as uh, geographical position systems for ascertaining, ascertaining coordinates for field work. I believe that strong partnerships uh, between the livestock sector and the ICT sector will be crucial uh, going forward in supporting work in the livestock sector, as this will enable them know our specific needs and create products that suit such needs strengthening partnerships and aligning priorities and goals for more efficient delivery of actions, such as the ICT I have uh, mentioned, uh, One Health partnerships, research, financials, and especially producers who usually have knowledge of their needs is very critical. And advocacy for communication in an up and downward manner in a down and upward manner, as well as um, in a sideways manner. Um, and all these are being deployed in the region for um, uh, coordination purposes. Um, thank you. 
thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vivian, you are, uh, for sharing about some of the concrete uh, practices and strategies that ECOWAS is deploying in, in this uh, phase. We will now move on to the representative from Startup, and this will be Dr. Domingos Stefanias Bobet. Over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I think um, uh, I will repeat what Godfrey had been saying. Um, the question is primarily how, to, how do we ensure continuity of livestock development in the context of strict COVID-19 containment measures? Because this was the, um, the process that was um, adopted by all the member states um, in, in our continent and the entire world. So that is the main challenge. Uh, and to this effect, um, within SADC, um, the Council of Ministers approved the guidelines for cross-border transport operations across the region to minimize or to mitigate these containment measures and ensure that the inputs and agriculture products can move from one place to another, even from outside the region or to outside the region. Um, and these guidelines uh, have been expanded uh, in collaboration with COMESA, East African Community, uh, which forms the tripartite, so that the whole region uh, under SADC, Eastern African Community and COMESA uh, could facilitate and mitigate this, this situation. The other aspects that uh, Godfrey has mentioned are the commitments that the ministers responsible for food security and agriculture uh, fisheries and um, I mean from the the, the, the African continent adopted uh, and um, uh, from the regional perspective uh, in SADC the ministers adopted the commitment that were uh, produced by African Union Commission FAO. Um, the aspect that I, I, I would like to highlight is that we should not reinvent the wheel. Uh, Godfrey has spoken very well Africa is not doing well in terms of agriculture. And in SADC region is not exception. We have assessed the biennial um, report of the implementation of the Malabo Declaration, 2015, 2025, we are not doing well. Um, the implementation of SDGs is there. Uh, SDG one, ending poverty, and SDG two, zero hunger. We are really pro progressing very little. So, um, in our context, um, we have the Livestock Development Program 2017-2021 that was approved in November 2017. And this Livestock Development Program is fully part of the implementation of the SADC Regional Agriculture Policy, um, which was approved in 2014. And uh, our Regional Agriculture Policy is what we call the CADAP Compact. So the instruments are there. And basically, um, to implement the regional agriculture policy in 2017, the SADC member states, they have um, um, approved what we call the regional agriculture investment plan 2017-2022. So the strategy is there, the plan is there. Uh, in terms of livestock development uh, program, which is implementing the regional agriculture policy, uh, it follows four objectives. The objective one is to enhance sustainable agriculture production, productivity, and competitiveness. And here within the livestock development program, uh, we are improving farmer access to improved genetic material and the adoption of biotechnology in livestock development. We are also addressing aspects related to enhancing conservation and sustainable use of animal genetic resources for food and agriculture. And in that context, in July 2020, we have approved the SADC Animal Genetics Resource Conservation and Utilization Strategy. The other aspects that we're addressing here is improved management of TADS, the transboundary animal diseases. And in that context, we have produced the food and mouth disease control pathway in June 2010. We have also produced the SADC uh, PPR eradication roadmap in November 2017. 
we have produced the highly pathogenic avian influenza preparedness plan in May 2018. We have produced the study guidelines on commodity-based trade approaches for managing food and mouth disease risk in beef in Southern Africa. This was done last year in June. We have also produced the SADC strategy for elimination of dog-mediated human rabies in July 2020. And also we are finalizing the One Health strategy uh, in related to antimicrobial resistance in collaboration with OIE, uh, WHO, and FAO. In the area of agricultural research and development in livestock, we are working with our Center for Coordination of Agricultural Research Development in Southern Africa uh, in their strategy uh, to address aspects specifically related to livestock. So we have produced this year a 10-year strategy in support for the implementation of livestock development plan. We are also working in terms of enhancing regional and national agriculture information management systems. And uh, specifically for livestock, we have developed the livestock information management system that is part of the overall agriculture information management system. And in this context, we are working uh, with FAO that they are finalizing the overall agriculture information management system. In terms of the uh, improvement uh, in terms of the regional and international trade and access to markets and agricultural pro products, uh, we have improved compliance with the SADC protocol on trade and address addressing specifically uh, sanitary and phytosanitary aspects. And also we have been working towards engaging public and private sector into investing in agricultural value chains. And in that regard, we are currently uh, finalizing the process of uh, establishment of the Agricultural Development Fund, which was approved in August 2017. We have started also um, last year, uh, established the Forum for Agri-Invest in order to engage the private sector, including small and medium uh, enterprise. And also we have established the SADC Business Forum uh, in August 2019 uh, to include the bigger private sector in the implementation of the um, agriculture uh, policy, which includes the, um, the livestock development uh, program. So basically these are the actions that are there. Uh, the only call that we are doing for the member states is to implement it so that really we transform the agriculture. And um, I, I think we should not uh, be worrying on trying to find new ways. I think the strategies are there, the cut up is here, we are not implementing CADAC as it should be. So it's a matter, I think COVID came to remind us that we are not doing well. And I think we have to move from strategies to the real work. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Domingos, for reminding us that uh, we need to do better, build on existing instruments, and not reinvent the wheel. Thank you for sharing on, on SADAC uh, activities. The last uh, uh, representative uh, is from IGAT, and this is uh, Dr. Ameha Sepsiba. Over to you. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, uh, I work for IGAD uh, Center for Pastoral Area Livestock Development, uh, IGPALD. IGAD is a regional economic community in Eastern Africa. And uh, I will give uh, a quick uh, highlight of uh, the various feedback we have collected from countries on the impact of COVID and, uh, and uh, what we, we, as IGAD, what we have done with member states and the partners uh, to respond. So uh, in the region uh, IGAD, I think most of you are aware the, the IGAD region is very rich in livestock resources. And these uh, livestock resources are very important in terms of livelihood, food security and nutrition, and also, of course, in uh, also as a source of income, including uh, generating hard currencies from export of meat and live animals uh, to Middle East and North Africa. 
some of the, the challenges uh, that have been observed uh, during uh, this pandemic, uh, the key ones, uh, restricted movement uh, by various countries. And this movement affected uh, veterinary services like surveillance, like vaccination, distribution of uh, inputs like vaccines and drugs. And also some produce are not uh, reaching to the required uh, market and also animals are not able to be, to be uh, uh, sold in the required markets. And uh, this has affected uh, heavily the, the, the livelihood of pastoral and agro-pastoral communities. The other major effect was market closure. And this affected uh, seriously also the, 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 the gate price. In some places we have uh, observed uh, and uh, report shows 40 to 60% of price reduction. We did some rapid survey uh, from EGAD with, uh, with uh, countries. And uh, also on the other hand, if you look at uh, the, the price of cereals has increased. And uh, this has been because of transportation costs and also some uh, uh, unfair practice of brokers. So in, in some uh, instances, uh, like for example, in South Sudan, the report shows 50% rise in prices. And you can see the pastoral agropastoral community has to sell more animals uh, com compared to pre-COVID to, to, to buy the same amount of uh, cereals. Uh, this is very important, which has helped us also in the strategy development, which I will be talking later. And there were also reduced slaughter operation uh, for various, uh, uh, some data collected, uh, the slaughterhouses uh, at, uh, at uh, domestic slaughterhouses and also export slaughterhouses has to do at uh, 40 to 60% reduced capacity. Uh, and the other observation we have had is uh, the, the, the meat, for example, uh, from IGAD countries is exported to Middle East, Gulf countries, cargo space, and also uh, uh, fare, cargo fare uh, has uh, uh, increased uh, highly, and uh, this affects uh, the, the, the whole the value chain. For example, uh, one, one uh, figure I can give you, one of the, 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 the airline is asking 1.3 USD per kg of meat to, to transport from Igad country to, to, to Dubai. So these are some of the key uh, observation uh, with, uh, you know, within the livestock, uh, uh, the, the feedback we have gathered and uh, so observation and reports to uh, the countries. And IGAD has, uh, has developed two important uh, regional strategies with member states and uh, partners uh, to support uh, countries, uh, minimize the effect of pandemic and recovery. One is a food security and nutrition response strategy uh, this uh, cover uh, three important hazards, the COVID, desert locusts and the floods, uh, which uh, has been uh, earlier mentioned. And this uh, strategy has been finalized and uh, submitted for resource mobilization within and also from outside. It covers emergency response, uh, preparedness and capacity enhancement, coordination and recovery and uh, uh, resilience building, including uh, trade facilitation and promotion. Uh, uh, the second uh, uh, strategy is economic river recovery strategy. This is also uh, to be finalized uh, very soon. So uh, I think uh, there are a number of details, but uh, Maybe if there are also discussions, uh, we, we can, we can uh, uh, cover through discussion. I, 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 I shall stop here. Over to you.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sepsibe, for sharing with us some of the uh, disruptions that you've seen in markets in the IGAT region and how this is affecting the incomes of the pastoral and agro-pastoral communities. You also noted that uh, there are impacts on the exports that these have also been affected. But uh, what is good is you, there are uh, strategies that uh, the region has come up with, which are seeking, which will address some of these impacts. Uh, thank you so much to the three uh, presenters in this session. What uh, seems to come out from all the three regions is that the ministers are committed. There's a commitment by ministers to address these challenges, working together with the African Union Commission and together with the other partners. So this is really a, a, a key step. And two, we heard from the three that there are policies in place and strategies which uh, need to be uh, put into action through the plans that uh, have been developed. And uh, for example, there is the food security and nutrition strategies which can be deployed in addressing some of the impacts that have been brought about by the pandemic. And there's also some economic recovery strategies that are in place. So this is good to, to note that the regions are active, they have the plans, and they're really uh, keen to strengthen and, and move this forward. From the ECOWAS region, just to highlight that they are, they are really seeking to strengthen the veterinary services for effective uh, disease control. And so they are also refocusing and adopting the One Health approach. They would like to see that uh, strengthened in the region. So in, in summary, this is what uh, the, the RECs have shared with us. And there's just again to remember that let's build on existing instruments and strengthen uh, some of the approaches that are already at hand and working with the partners in this effort. So again, thank you so much for sharing with us and continue to post some of the notes uh, on the chat so that we can pick up this uh, excellent work that is going on in the region. But it was also interesting to hear the presenters really indicate the initial challenges when the pandemic uh, started and how I had lost you for a minute. Yeah, I, I hope I'm back. Michael, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can, Bunny. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Yeah, my lights went off. So thanks that I'm back. So thanks to the Rex, and uh, let's, con let's, let's hope that we continue to share on the charts and as we go to the other sessions uh, tomorrow. But I also wanted to pick up from the panel the pandemic panel. Thank you again for, for the excellent sharing and uh, presentation and ra raising some key issues. You, you raised some areas that uh, on, on some of the impacts that most worry you. And what uh, I was left with, a key note takeaway for me was a concern about the state of food insecurity in the continent that this is really growing at alarming rates. So it's, it's a, a great concern. And uh, this was highlighted uh, from the African Union Commission. So it's something that really, the pandemic adds on, on an already difficult situation of uh, state of food insecurity. And um, so there was also a concern about the hidden effects of COVID that is it's really going to hit hard the most vulnerable in the communities. And so this is a, a great concern. So what are some of the uh, responses of uh, addressing these challenges that were highlighted? Um, we, we heard that some of the bold next steps that could be taken 
uh, include the need to strengthen veterinary services. So this issue of uh, uh, disease control, it's, it keeps coming up as we heard also from the Rex. So strengthening the veterinary services, it's, it's one that came up and the need to increase investment. The, there's already an underinvestment in the livestock sector. So the pandemic adds on that pressure. So there's a call to increase investment by the government and other partners. Uh, there's a call to focus on people that really let's pay attention. The most vulnerable uh, group in the communities might struggle more. Let's, let's not leave anyone behind, no one to be left behind, focus on people. And also this is seen as an opportunity for the livestock sector to deploy and increase adoption of improved technologies for sustainable uh, livestock production. So these are some of the highlights uh, colleagues that I picked up from these two uh, sessions. The panel, excellent panel, um, and the, the uh, great pre uh, sharing from the Rex. So it, it gives me a, a pleasure this time just to thank you all. Um, I took the time to uh, wrap up as my colleague uh, Martin Farasa was uh, not on the call. He had last minute challenges with connection. So I hope you will continue to have a look at the chat. And also let's uh, remember that the outputs from this uh, meeting will contribute to the uh, global multi-stakeholder platform meeting later this month and also to the events that are lined up for, for next year. So colleagues, I uh, just want to thank you all for your great uh, contribution in session one and session two. We have come to the end of our session. I just want to take the time to remind everyone that tomorrow we start session three at uh, 14 hours this Africa time. And the, the Zoom loop link was already shared. Um, I think my colleagues might uh, resend that. So we hope that you will be able to join us and continue these uh, rich discussions that we've had in these two sessions. And uh, let's continue to look at what are some of the priority, uh, priorities and actions that can help us to build back better together as the different stakeholders in the global agenda for sustainable livestock. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening, uh, good morning, or good night, depending on where you are. Thank you again to all the uh, facilitators, the presenters, and to everyone who is participating here. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. And remember to visit, uh, tomorrow you can log in a bit earlier and visit the share fair beforehand, before the two o'clock meeting. There's quite a lot that is on shore there. And thank you so much. Bye-bye.